A specter has been haunting the international community. The specter of Leninism. In all seriousness, I'm not here to throw around useless buzzwords like tanky or make generalizations about authoritarianism or whatever, nor do I want to judge the past from a high horse of present knowledge. I'll be critiquing some elements of Leninist theory, however, so this video is only for those who can handle that as well. If Reagan can unite Congress under neoliberalism, then surely most Marxists can get along at the dinner table too. As for the other leftists, maybe just for opposition against the capitalist hegemony's sake, where statists can wait to tell the anarchists they told them so, and the rubble of fallen confederations with relief aid like Cuba would, while the anarchists can wait to tell the unjustified hierarchies they told them so, the moment they began to corrupt on the side of revisionism and opportunity, where there will surely be innocent remnants to align with and shelter. But this is going a bit too far and a little too larpy. Having been a Marxist Leninist for give or take a year, and having always continued texts from Lenin and other Leninists for going on five, the ideology remains fresh and rent free in my head. In addition to that desire to put all I've learned all these years and then some finally out there. But before diving into the nitty gritty, let it be known that we shall recognize no one possessed by the spirits of dead revolutionaries, who echo arguments way too detached from the relevancy of the modern proletariat. As Marx once said, the awakening of the dead in those revolutions serve the purpose of glorifying the new struggles, parodying the old, magnifying the given task in the imagination, recoiling its solution and reality, finding once more the spirit of revolution and not making its ghosts walk again. Nor shall we but would forget those who plagiarize Mao Zedong's homework at the expense of socialism with Chinese characteristics into a universally applicable set of instructions that match the idealism of Baba Fakin's constitution for a future socialist America, as well as those who gasp at promises of a state socialist China by 2077 or whatever. All social life is essentially practical. The standpoint of the old materialism is civil society. The standpoint of the new is human society or social humanity. These are the words of an intellectually maturing Marx in 1845 at the foreground of proletarian revolutionary thought that began with his thesis on Feuerbach, a statement that would lay out the framework of the Socialist International, with great observance of the short-lasting Paris Commune that still sparked hope for the revolutionaries despite all shortcomings. In contrast to the notorious minority of defeatist philosophers like Verlet, Leclerc, and Roux, who saw the revolutions as means that would only benefit a category of people, as noted in Origins and Functions of the Party Form, instead of universally liberating, but like in Marx's critique in the Holy Family, they proclaimed the need for a new revolution led in the name of material reason, where Marxism as a product of human history was only capable due to the proletarian struggle, which as Marx declared in 1871 within the Civil War in France, has no ideas to realize but to set free elements of a new society with which old collapsing bourgeois society itself is pregnant. Essentially saying that for a post-capitalist society to succeed, it must shut itself completely of capitalism. Going further back to 1844 when Marx was a little softer on humanistic principles, his ideas remained consistent if not severely corrected by the time he grasped proletarian significance. From communism as the positive transcendence of private property as human self-estrangement, therefore the real appropriation of human essence by and for man, communism as the return of man to himself as a social human being, a return accomplished consciously and embracing the entire wealth of previous development. To later that year, a class meant for a civil society which is not meant for a civil society, in a state which is the dissolution of all estates, the present state which cannot emancipate itself without emancipating itself from all other spheres of society, and thereby emancipating all other spheres. The complete loss of man hence can win itself only through the complete rewinning of man. The dissolution of society as a particular estate is the proletariat. That is to say that capitalist society has shaped a culture for the working class to be civil, that is, submissive for a class of people. The working class in question does not ultimately desire to be servile to the means of production, fruits of their labor, and the figures of authority that run them. To be resolved through the spread of awareness and self-education throughout the broader masses and desire the liberation of itself away from being an oppressed socio-economic and passive socio-political role. But what should we make of Karl Marx's boldest definition of the state yet yeah, in 1848, just four years later from that last quote? 
so many often see being a contradiction in definitions and reduced down to a progressing theorist. The executive of the modern state is but a committee for managing the common affairs of the whole bourgeoisie, and that their ends can be attained only by the forcible overthrow of all existing social conditions. Social conditions like the ones of the superstructure and dialectical materialism, which include the state apparatus itself. While Marx had certainly progressed from a student of Hegel to his biggest critic, and the more humanistic philosophical worldview that materialized into one grounded with the proletariat, it should be obvious that Marx had it moved on from what he established at all, only expanded upon it. With an easier definition of the state that needs no explaining as it criticizes the executive committee that oversees its state, this narrative of the state being intrinsically connected with the capitalist class is a consistent one that continues to another expansion in 1852. In the 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte, Marx relates the revolutionary nature of the French bourgeois revolution to the falsehoods of revolutionaries of his time who desired to uphold similar facades of democratic states. The social revolution cannot take its poetry from the past, but only from the future. It cannot begin with itself before it has stripped away all superstitions of the past. The former revolutions required recollections of past world history to smother their own content. The revolution of the 19th century must let the dead bury their dead to arrive at its own content. In the same year, Marxian American Union officer Joseph Weidemeyer on the subject of the dictatorship of the proletariat writes, it's quite plain that there cannot be any question of gradual, peaceful transitions, where he recites examples of English philosopher Oliver Cromwell's conceptualizations of Committee of France as sufficient dictatorship in praxis through terrorism required to overthrow the bourgeoisie. Marx challenges him with a critical response. Long before me, bourgeois historians had described the historical development of the struggle between the classes as had bourgeois economists. My contribution was one to show that the existence of classes is merely bound with certain historical phases in the development of production. Two, that the class struggle leads to the dictatorship of the proletariat. And three, that this dictatorship itself constitutes no more than a transition to the abolition of all classes and to a classless society. Indeed, this concerned Marx, then Engels and Marx both in 1868, after the member Bakunin had conspired with the theorists of the Russian left, as a response, he and his faction were expelled, splitting apart the Alliance of Socialist Democracy and International Workingmen's Association after quoting Russian Marxian theorist Sergei Necheyev's Foundations of the Future Social System as reason alone to justify it. The ending of the existing social order and renewal of life with aid of new principles can be accomplished only by concentrating all means of social existence in the hand of our committee. The committee, as soon as present institutions are overthrown, proclaims that all is private property, orders the setting up of worker societies, and at the same time, publishes statistical tables compiled by experts in pointing branches of labor needed in certain localities. He without reason to have joined in our tell will have no other alternative but work or death. To which Marx replies, What a beautiful model of barracks communism. Here you have it all. Communal eating, communal sleeping, assessors and offices regulating education, production, and consumption. In a word, all social activity and to crown all our committee, anonymous and unknown to anyone as the supreme director. This is indeed the purest anti-authoritarianism. Marx expanded on the state further in 1872. The state and system of society are not two different things. The state is the system of society insofar as the state admits the existence of social defects. It sees their cause either in laws of nature, which no human power can command, or in private life, which does not depend on the state or in activity of an administration which does not depend on it. Then he analyzed the faults of the state and the remedies it invoked. Finally. Every state seeks to cause an accidental or deliberate shortcomings of the administration, and therefore it seeks the remedy for its ills in the measures of the administration. Why? Precisely because the administration is the organizing activity of the state. Similarly, in 1874, Engels disputed and disagreed with Russian Marxian theorist Peter Dikachev's notion that Russia could become a global pace-setter by independently making a social revolution of Tsarist Russia, with inspirations of the old Russian commune of Upshina on its own, despite the backwardsness brought on with the state's semi-feudalist base. Despite Marx and Engels' shared concerns with socialist states suggested by the likes of Necheyev and Tikhachev, 
they would both become the leading inspirations of the Bolsheviks, from Nechev's ideas of an organized revolutionary committee that seizes the state, to Tikhachev's ideas of establishing a revolutionary dictatorship after the state had been overthrown. Lenin was familiar with Sergei Nechev, as his brother Alexander actively engaged in an organization that based its party program on Nechev's theories, to which Lenin considered Nechev the titan of the revolution and that all communists must read Nechev. Soviet officials later admitted that Tikhachev was the primary inspirer and role model in the great art of conspiracy, as well as admitting that the Soviet Union was based on Nechev's version of revolutionary socialism as the one that was taking place in the Soviet Union itself. But despite all of this, why then would Karl Marx, and no more than a year later, in 1875, write the following in critique of the Gotha program? Between capitalist and communist society, there lies the period of the revolutionary transformation of the one into the other. Corresponding to this is also a political transition period in which the state can be nothing but the revolutionary dictatorship of the proletariat. To answer that question, we first need to understand what the Gotha program was to gather necessary historical context. Marx indeed critiques the Gotha program of the German Social Democratic Party and expresses his views on how socialism should be structured. Marx's critique, among other things, addresses the state-centric nature of this program as their answer for the later stages of communist society. Working class, in the course of its development, will substitute for the old civil society an association which will exclude classes and their antagonism of liberating themselves to classlessness. And there will be no more so-called political power properly, since political power is precisely the official expression of antagonism of control in civil society. So Marx's answer for late-stage communism after the seizure and abolition of the state? Not surprisingly, it's late-stage communism. After the enslaving subordination of the individual to the division of labor, and the antithesis between mental and physical labor has vanished, after labor has become not only a means of life but life's prime want, after the production forces have also increased with the all-around development of the individual, and all the springs of cooperative wealth flow more abundantly, then can the narrow horizon of bourgeois right be crossed out in its entirety, and society inscribe on its banners from each according to his ability to each according to his needs. Essentially, Marx criticizes the Gotha program for maintaining remnants of the old capitalist system, such as the continuation of disproportionate rewards and labor, resulting in economic disparities and potential class reseparation of conflict and interests, in favor of distribution based on society's needs. From a scientific point of view, this program expresses a definite development of social process. Nevertheless, the present program has a drawback. It is Lazalian. The scientific justification for the retention of this old name is they corresponded to everlasting relations, which will remain even when our generation has been buried. Marx criticizes the program for being influenced by one of his rivals, Ferdinand Lazal, on the basis that certain elements in this program are more in line with Lazalian ideas than a scientific understanding of socialism, capable of representing the proletarian masses. In the same year of 1875, Marx followed up the critique of the Gotha program with his conspicuous of Bakunin's statism and anarchy, where he repeats Bakunin's rhetorical statement in question. The Germans number around 40 million. Will, for example, all 40 million become members of the government? To which Marx replies, Certainly, since the whole thing begins with the self-governance of a commune. Engels echoes a similar narrative of the presence of proletarian dictatorship in his letter to August Bebel and yet again 1875, where he reflects on the significance of the Paris Commune as successful, despite it inevitably falling to the French bourgeois state forces and its allies with. What elasticity! What historical initiative! What a capacity for sacrifice in this commune! And its whole policy, its whole program, a mass dictatorship, and what a mass dictatorship it was! In its downfall, we may now see its real significance. It will start afresh the socialist movement. This sentiment continued with Marx up until his death, in addition to Frederick Engels who wrote a year after Marx's passing in 1884, with the origin of the family, private property, and the state, that the state is by no means a power imposed on society from without, rather a product of society at a certain stage of development. The admission that this society has become entangled in an insoluble contradiction with itself, that has split the irreconcilable antagonisms which it is powerless to dispel, 
These classes with conflicting economic interests might not consume themselves and society in fruitless struggle. It became necessary to have a power seemingly above society that would arise out of society, but placing itself above it and alienating itself more and more from it, as is the nature of the state. Engels here is bluntly stating that all forms of the state contradict themselves with class conflicts. In this particular example, a bureaucracy with members originating out of the proletarian struggle is more focused on struggling to purge itself and alienate itself from said proletariat by placing itself above them as is the nature of the state. Consistently with Marx and Engels, the latter of whom dropped this just three decades before Lenin wrote his own State and Revolution. And speaking of the devil, Lenin's only reassurance of the fears of revolutionary states and their democratically centralized bureaucratic administrations, which Marx and Engels addressed and harbored from 1848 to 1895, is only asking his problematic congressional listeners at the Third Congress of 1920, let us have more labor discipline, let us pull ourselves together and work with determination, sacrificing all private interests. We are materialists, and you cannot satisfy us with power of authority. We cannot succeed otherwise, but if we carry out this decision of the party, we shall be absolutely and completely invincible. <laughs> Cracks of the revolutionary state from its intellectually hegemonic vanguard revealed themselves since the 20s. Then, with the death of Lenin in 1924, when Stalin put socialism in one country at the forefront of the communist international since 1925, then with the ousting of Trotsky with the Soviet Union altogether in 1926, Stalin's rejection of Yugoslavia's self-determination in 1948, Hodja's hypocrisy to consider his anti krushevite traditionally Marxist Leninist position to be justified as self-determination away from the Soviet Union despite ridiculing aforementioned Yugoslavia constantly for doing the same. Khrushchev's de-Stalinization era three years after the death of Stalin in 1956, further bureaucracy with synthetic social imperialism as with the likes of interrupting Korea's natural proletarian revolution or East Germany's and all the rest in Eastern Soviet bloc that pretty much fell with the collapse of the Soviet Union, to Yeltsin taking advantage of powers formidicated by Gorbachev allowing member states to gain independence from the Union Treaty and collapsing it in the process. All of this to supposedly set up the foundational conditions of a classless, moneyless, and stateless society. As was the trend of the late Russian Marxist front, Lenin, like the proto-Bolsheviks before him, ignored the original definition of the state and dictatorship of the proletariat as was already clearly and consistently presented by Marx and Engels that eventually became orthodox Marxism. But even in the idealistic search for the next head to succeed Marx and Engels, even Karl Kotsky ended up a social democrat. Lenin claims that the dictatorship of the proletariat is at best revolutionary in character because of the origins of the vanguard members to Lenin's anthology where at worst mere presentation of the question, dictatorship of the party, party dictatorship of leaders, or dictatorship of the class, party dictatorship of the masses, testifies to the most incredible and hopelessly muddled thinking, and to go so far as to compare the dictatorship of the masses with the dictatorship of leaders is ridiculously absurd and stupid. A narrative shared consistently by people like Gregory Zinoviev, chairman of the Comintern in the 1920s and even Leon Trotsky before his breakup with Stalin in 1926, the likes of which ignore Marx's warnings that suicide is against nature, therefore the state cannot believe in the inherent impotence of the administration, that is, in its own impotence. It can perceive only formal, accidental deficiencies in the administration and try to remedy them. And if these modifications prove fruitless, the conclusion is drawn that social ills are a natural imperfection independence of man, a law of God, or the will of private individuals too spoiled to be capable of responding to the administration's good intentions. How preposterous these private individuals are. They grumble at the government whenever it restricts their freedom, and at the same time they demand that the government prevent the inevitable results of their opportunistic freedom. A dive into socialism in one country and the question of international Marxism led to the finding of further contradictions. It's commonly supported by many modern Marxist-Leninists that socialism in one country is a truly international, truly Leninist, and the only tactically sound theory on the question of worldwide revolution. The idea that it's possible to build socialism in one country and correct to do so, and that the first socialist state is to form the base area that supports the worldwide communist movement. 
followed by the use of Lenin's speech at the Third All-Russian Trade Union Congress to support the suggestion of Lenin supporting socialism in one country, in contrast to Anna Strong's idea that socialism in one country was founded by Stalin in 1924. As a response to public doubt of socialism arising out of backward post peasant conditions at all. As of April 8, 1920, the chief feature of the present phase is the transition from war tasks to tasks of peaceful economic development. This is not the first time Soviet government had passed through such a phase, but the second time since the party was established that history has brought the work of peaceful construction to the foreground. So is socialism in one country then? Just a temporary phase of existence like Lenin's establishment of the militia system after the 1918 9th Congress of the Russian Communist Party? Or Stalin's war communism in response to fascism prevalent throughout Western Europe? When we tackled the problems of the dictatorship of one-man management for the first time in 1918, there was no civil war and no experience to speak of. Dictatorial powers and one-man management are not contradictory to socialist democracy. This is not an answer to questions that have only just arisen, but deep in the roots of the very conditions of the period in which we live. It was not only the experience of the Red Army and its victorious civil war, but something bound with tasks of the dictatorship of the proletariat in general, to concentrate all attention on labor discipline and the economic development of socialism and the basis of the dictatorship of the proletariat as we understand it. Because on an international scale, capitalism is still stronger, both from a military and economic standpoint than the Soviet power and Soviet system. Thus, the connection of socialism in one country with international Marxism, not out of solidarity and support toward natural proletarian revolutions globally, but as a near-permanent revolutionary expansionist strategy. Forms of struggle against capital change. At one time they acquire an open international character, and another they are centered in one country. For the dictatorship of the proletariat to acquire world significance, it had to be consolidated in the practice in one country. Only then did the capitalists of all other countries become convinced that this matter was acquiring international significance. Because these modifications, predicted by and to paraphrase Marx, proved fruitless, the conclusion should be made that the position of the hammer can only see nails, a position forever tempted by naturally growing social ills out of the best intending revolutionary technocrats, who assert merely having a communist party and central planning makes it a non-bourgeois state. For the sake of consistency, I will not criticize the Bolsheviks, however, for potentially disagreeing with or failing to know about Marx's thoughts on Russia and the peasantry. After all, between Anna Strong's relief aid travels and interviews from Stalin to Mao, the general Marx's current at the time was that socialism had to come out of a developed capitalist country, as expected from Germany before Hitler's takeover. leading to dichotomies between the intellectual urban worker and the less literate peasantry that might have shaped the seeming need to have a group that centralized an intellectual hegemony with a revolutionary vanguard in the first place, and why such hostilities between them and the peasants continued to persist. With all of that said, it's still interesting to bring up. If revolution comes at the opportune moment, if it concentrates all its forces as to allow the rural commune full scope, the latter will soon develop as an element of regeneration in Russian society and an element of superiority over the countries enslaved by the capitalist system. According to Gilles Duov in Capitalism and Communism, who reflects on this very letter, underdeveloped countries, to use a capitalist phrase, would not have to go through industrialization. In many parts of Asia, Africa, and Latin America, capital oppresses labor but has not subjugated it to what Marx considered real submission. It dominates societies which it has not yet fully turned into money and wage labor relationships. Old forms of social communal life still exist. Communism would regenerate a lot of them, as Marx expected a Russian peasant commune might do with the help of some Western technology applied differently. In wrapping up our exploration into the nuances of Marxism-Leninism, this ideology, like any other, is not immune to internal debates and adaptations. The perspectives within broader Marxist tradition demonstrates that the conversation is far from over. Furthermore, the richness of Marxist-Leninist thought lies not only in the existing texts, but also in the ongoing dialogues, debates, and critiques offered by those who follow it. Whether you find yourself resonating with Marxist-Leninist ideals or feeling differently about them, 
the journey towards understanding past and present and shaping our future continues, as well as the necessity of Marxist internationalism and broader leftist unity. This has been Daring to Criticize Marxism-Leninism. If you liked this video or learned something new, leave a like. If you didn't, then leave a dislike. Subscribe for more content like this.